can give us a comment or like us to let us know how we're doing. We thank you for taking time on your busy schedule to worship with us because a lot of times on Sunday mornings and afternoons, people spend time at the house just watching cars doing other stuff. So we really appreciate you being here. Again, on Facebook and YouTube people, like us or leave us a comment so we know how we're doing. Before I start to preach, or you'd like to say a quick word to Christ, a prayer, we bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I want to come to you and say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be in the house of the Lord just one more time. Thank you for my help. Thank you for my strength. Thank you for allowing me to be in the pulpit on a Sunday morning. Thank you for everyone who's here. Heavenly Father, let us speak your word, preach your word. Let me preach your word with clarity and conviction. Heavenly Father, let me get a re really relevant word to your people. Heavenly Father, I'm not sure as the word goes out, let the word not come back void. I'm not sure what are my steps in your word. Heavenly Father, that's why I've been praying for something for a long time. And my mother's been praying for a son, and her mother's been praying for a spouse or sibling. Just answer their prayers. Heavenly Father, we ask them this. Now have a blessing in your son, in Jesus' name. Amen. My text today comes from Joel, the second chapter, verses 21 through 25. Again, the text is Joel. Second chapter, verses 21 through 25. It says, I'm using the King James Version. It reads, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. And the fig tree and the vine do we yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the flowers shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillars, and the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. Ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wonderfully with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. You may be seated. I want to use for a subject. Restore what the canker worm stole. Restore what the canker worm stole. I came here today for many things, but one of the reasons I came here today was to tell you that God will restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten. He will restore the years that the crawling locust has eaten. He will restore the years that the consuming locust has eaten. It will restore the later years that the chewing locusts have eaten. The great month, only the son among you, he will restore those years. In case you didn't know, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes to give us life more abundantly. But God, God is a God of restoration. God came to restore lives. Has anyone lost anything? If you're like me, I lost many, many things. People lose jobs. People lose houses. People lose family members, mothers, fathers. People lose health. If COVID went on, somebody probably lost someone from COVID. People lose people to diabetes. They can't go anywhere without a machine. We lose relationships. You know, if you're dating, been married for 10, 12 years, and your spouse just leaves you. We lose money. We lose time. But when things are going good, driving, we're happy. We're happy if we have money in the bank, a good paying job, children doing well, no health problems. But other times,
sometimes you think God has abandoned you. I'm talking about times when the car breaks down, the bills are due, you lose your job, the child is struggling in school, the love of your life left you, the cat left you, the dog left you. That's bad when your pets leave you. So, if you're a farmer, you know about the damage of corn and wheat and grain that happened during like the 1930s. It's happening in the Midwest, around the states of Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. What happened was they had a, a bad drug, and the grasshoppers, locusts, and grasshoppers and bugs, they swarmed, and they devastated the crops. Locusts and grasshoppers are in the same family, like insect cousins, but they're some, among some of the most feared pests we have among farmers. So what happened was the plague of insects occurred when conditions are right. You have to have a certain condition that got to be right for the insects to swarm. In other words, they, they lay the eggs in the wet soil, and the wet soil becomes vulnerable to like fungus. But when the swarms develop, they explode beneath your feet. You know, it's because it's been a drought, and they just come up like something coming up from your feet. And they be like something rolling in front of you. They be like they hit you, get all around your body. They cling onto your clothes, and you be like immersed with these insects. Back in around July 1931, the swarm was said to be so thick that they said it blocked out the sun. So I could take a shovel and just shovel the grasshoppers and the insects with a scoop. And that's a lot of things. Have you ever seen a cornfield driving down the road? Imagine you've seen the same cornfield, but after a while the cornfield was going down, they eat up everything. They eat them to the ground, make it bare. But this tragedy or devastation it used to happen in the U.S. in the 30s, but it doesn't happen in the U.S. anymore, but it still happens in Africa and parts of the Middle East. They said a swarm is so, so big that it contains like a billion bugs. That's a lot. Going we'll back to the text, and Joel 2.25 says, And if I restore to you the years for which the locusts have eaten, canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, my girl army which I sent you, so, what are canker worms? Kind of glad you asked. I'm talking about worms, insects. What is a canker worm? In the next few minutes, I try to explain to you what canker worms are. I have three different points today. The first point is what are canker worms? My second point are the effects of canker worms. My third point is how to restore what the canker worm stole. So my first point, what is a canker worm? Let me break it down into two parts to make it easier to understand. First of all, what is a canker and what is a worm? A canker is a, like a destructive fungus. It's on trees and damages the barks. The fungus, like, it rots uh, vegetables. It can also be like ulcerous condition in humans and animals. If you ever had like a canker sore in your mouth, it's very, very painful. But sometimes it can also be like a corrupting influence or a difficult situation to eradicate. In other words, it could be something like racism or sexism. Something that's in our grain so hard to get out of. But worms, what are worms? You've all seen an earthworm before, I'm sure, a caterpillar. But worms are like larvae of moths. Some worms, they stay worms. Other worms change from the infant to the adulthood. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, have you ever seen a, a tadpole before? A tadpole swims at first, and a tadpole, then a tadpole becomes a frog. Also, a butterfly. A butterfly is a pretty, but when they first became a butterfly, they weren't a butterfly. So what happened to butterflies? They eggs. And a little larvae becomes a caterpillar. This little larvae is inside of like a cocoon. And then inside of the cocoon, it's like a certain stage they go to, which change from a uh, worm or caterpillar to butterfly. Call this a chrysalis stage. Or pretty much it's the stage that the caterpillar goes from a caterpillar to butterfly. You have the locust or the grasshopper. They lay these eggs, they lay eggs in the ground. Where earlier I was talking about how they swarm, they lay eggs in the ground. They come up from the ground. So if they, they locust lay eggs in the ground, and it goes to like a second stage, like a nymph or 
harbor, then it comes a dough. This whole process takes place within three to five months. This female, she lay eggs in some soil, and these eggs are hatched after about two weeks. And the hopper, which is next stage, they uh, shed bodies and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. This whole process takes about four to six weeks. And then it becomes an adult in about three weeks. And the adults can lay about 90 to 160 eggs. They have two times a year. And this little locust will eat about his weight in a day, which is about two grams. Just imagine a picture in your mind. If you have a half a mile square of locusts, they can eat about the same amount of food that 3,000 people eat. So that's a lot of food, a lot of devastation. So Isaiah, the 51st, in verse 8, talks about the caterpillar comes from the moth. So Isaiah 51 and 8 says, the caterpillar of the cloth moth, it comes from the moth. You go Micah 7, 17 says, when it is said, they should move out of their holes like worms, perhaps serpents, or creepy things. It's talking about like the stages, how they move. Job also called worms lowly things. The worms are like lowly things, that, like low things are things that on your feet. Things people look down, but things people frown on. So what is a canker worm? A canker worm is sometimes called a caterpillar. It's like a winged or larvae. It's like a canker worm eggs that come up in the spring and fall. And some people call it a canker worm the, the licking, licking locust because it licks up or it eats a lot of grass. A canker worm is a worm at first, then it gets wings and flies away. But they have, still have canker worms today, but they're so small, but they don't, you don't want to know anything about it unless they get out of hand. So canker worms are really, really important, but they can be damaging because they'll mess up a landscape and trees. And these pomper worms are just caterpillars who feed on, feed on trees. They're like a little green hairy worms. Locusts, I'm talking about different kind of insects, they're all like, they're all pests, I call them, but they, it's all different variations of them. Yeah, grasshoppers, locusts, uh, canker worms, worms, butterflies, they're all, to me, they're all pests. But the locusts have many different characteristics. For example, locusts are so bad, they call them gnawing locusts. They, they go out and eat stuff. Call them the shearing locusts. They go out and eat stuff down. Have their swarmers. I mean, they got so many different locusts that they overtake you. You have to finish them. Eat up everything that's left behind. Remember earlier I talked about eating the corn stalks down to the ground? You have the creaker that explains how they sound. In Revelation, it talks about demonic locusts. They don't have to attack the vegetation and advance against God's people who don't have the seal in the forehead. Pretty much the locusts in the Bible and the locusts now cause great, great destruction. In Revelation, talk about the locust king in the Bible. And the locust, locust king is called Satan. So for just for the last few minutes, I'm talking about a lot of different things. I just try to tell you how destructive the locusts are and how they develop in stages, you know, from the eggs, egg stage, get the screen, they develop in the egg stage, then they have to develop in the larvae stage, how much they eat and how destructive they are. And like the swarming locusts are really, really destructive. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why is he talking about locusts? Sometimes when you read the Bible or go through the Bible, it talks about things that are hard to understand. It talks about things I call, it talks about things like parables and allegories, you know. Allegories is like, it gives you a certain message, a certain story about certain things right you now, which that story has a hidden meaning. It refers to something else. And for example, you all heard the story of the uh, ant and the grasshopper. You had this person in your family, probably he or she, because they don't work. What they'll do is, uh, they say, be like the ant. The ant works all summer long, works in the rain, works in the heat. He throws that food, like the grasshopper. All you have to jump around and have fun and sing and dance all year long. So they compare the ant to the grasshopper. It's an allegory. This has a hidden meaning. Then this leads me to my second point. My second point is the effects of canker worms. 
everything in life, whether it's small or big, has an effect. A worm has an effect on you. A worm can be small, but it still has a certain effect. If you have your Bible, go back with me to Job, the second chapter, verse 25. It says, And I will restore to you the years the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, pump worm, and my great, great army, which I sent among you. So how many years have you wasted before you repented? It's clean. How many years did you take to surrender to Jesus? Earlier, I was talking about losing time. I was talking about how the car breaks down, how the bills are due, they lose their job, they lost their wages, how the children may be failing in school. I talked about failed relationships. I also talked about how many years the canker room had taken from you. Sometimes the canker room is not necessarily a canker room. It could be sin or something different. But why that? Rebellion. Canker room of rebellion. How about how many, how many years in your life have you lost to the canker room of sin? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, 18th chapter, verses 21 to 25. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, 18th chapter, verse 21 to 25. Uh, it's talking about forgiveness and sin. And some reason asking about how many times should you forgive a person? Seven times, or 490 times. It's pretty much another day called the parable of the unforgiving servant. So Matthew 18, verse 21 to 25 says, Then Peter came and said to him, How often will my brother sin against me? And I will forgive them. As many as seven times, Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy, seven, seventy times seven times. That's a lot of different times. So, if you want to go to heaven, my brothers and sisters, you need to forgive others like God forgave you. You should forgive them once or twice. Forgive them more times. The significance of the number is seven times, or seven times seven is not really the number, 490 times. It's just forgiven over and over again. Like, we're like, some people, we call ourselves Christians, right? But we do the right things, we speak in tongues, we go to church, we do everything. But we sometimes forget to forgive our brother. And as Matthew, there was this king, and you know, kings have a lot of money, a lot of power. He wanted to settle his debts with his servants. And he found this one servant owed 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is about a lot of money, it's about 20 years' wages, about 10,000 bags of gold. And since the servant can pay, the master told him to be, he's going to make the servant be sold, put in jail until payment is made. The servant was a smart servant. So the servant fell on his knees and he begged the king. He said, King, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And the king was a gracious king. He felt pity on him. So he forgave the debt. But the same servant, he went out and Found someone who owed him money. He didn't owe him that much money. He owed him maybe like a hundred denarii or maybe like a hundred days wages or around three months labor. He seized the guy who got back, bothered with him. He choked him. He said, pay me what you owe. So the fellow servant did like he did. He paid it for him and said, have mercy on me. Have patience with me. He refused. He sent the man to prison. But people talk, you know, you're a Christian, you got to watch what you do and watch what you're doing around other people because people watch you, people talk. So other servants saw what he did. They went to talk to the master. And the master called him in. He said, I forgave you all his debt. You would forgive the person who owes you. So the master sent him, put him in jail to pay his debts. Verse 35, and it says, So also, Heavenly Father, I would do every one of you if you don't forgive.
forgive your brother from your heart. In other words, God is saying we should forgive other people over and over again. If God forgives you, you should forgive other people. So you should ask yourself for forgiveness every day. You wonder why every day? Because we sin all the time. We say it again, it's pretty important. You ask for forgiveness every day. Even when God gives you instructions on how to pray, to pray daily. So I don't want to talk to you too much about canker one of the sin of forgiveness. But many Christians are saved, and they know they're saved. They pray ministers, teachers, preachers, apostles, prophets, but they still have forgiveness in their heart. And you say, how so? Well, I don't know. I'm not God, but I can tell you a simple thing about forgiveness, because I've sinned, you've sinned. You may not go to the nightclub anymore. You may not even get drunk anymore. You may not even use drugs. But you may have forgiveness in your heart. You say, how do you know? Well, I can't tell you about yourself. I can tell you what I think. If a person did something to you in the past that maybe you felt bad about, you forgave that person, right? You think you forgave them in your mind, but actually you didn't forgive them. You said, how do I know? Well, I can tell you a quick test. You say someone stole something from you, you say you forgave them, but you haven't seen that person in, say, a couple days, a month or so, you see that person in the face, the first thing that comes to your mind when that person, you see that person, is it what he did to you wrong? <laughs> Is it, if that person needs help, would you help them? Or right, if you see that person, can you think of a positive thought about that person who did? Or do you think about revenge or what he stole from you? Well, my brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, that's a sign that you really haven't forgave that person. You think you did, but you didn't. So sin is like a, a, a caterpillar. It takes a caterpillar on a leaf, it takes one bite at a time, a little spot, a little spot, you know? That's what sin is like, you know? It gets in your heart and it loses the rest of your, your body. So I'm, telling, I'm here to tell you, whatever that person, he or she did to you, whatever that man or woman did to you, let it go. It's not losing your soul over. Let it go. God said it says forgiveness as far as it is from the east to the west. This is one of the reasons I said earlier we need prayer, prayer, and more prayer. So when you go to funerals, some preachers preach about the beginning of life and the end of life. life. But I talk about the dash, what's in the middle. Is the dash in your life, is it a waste of a month, is it a waste of days, is it a waste of years? Did you waste that with sin, drinking, using drugs, fornication, lying, stealing, cheating, lust, greed, love of money? I regret what the came from so for me. I'm sure you do too, but I don't really care what he stole because God's word said it would store what he stole from you. To me, that means if he stole something for three days, three minutes, 30 days, or 30 years, God says he will restore the wasted year, the canker worm. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a lot about canker worm. The canker worm could mean a lot of different things. Remember, earlier I talked about allegories of different things. So it could represent sin. It could represent different things to me and you. The canker worm could mean different, many different things. But the Bible says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worms and the caterpillar and palmer worm have eaten. God will restore that to you. He's talking about this great army out there. He sent the great army, right? The great army. What is the great army? Like I said, it could be many different things, but the great army could be a plague of locusts. It could be tests and sin upon your household. It could be stages of sin on you. It could be a prophecy about the end of the world, about the swarm of locusts. But locust swarm mean a great devastation. This is just a prophecy from the Lord, gave to Job. He said, tell your children about it. Tell your children that I'm telling children about it. So us as Christians, if we tell our children about God, if we tell our grandkids about God, if we tell our brothers and sisters about God, and Job, second chapter, verse 1, it's a warning to us. It says, repent and turn from our wicked ways. Job is warning his people to tell them what God told them. He said, army is coming to bring great darkness and devastation. So God is warning us through his prophets. So Job was likening these uh, spirits of destruction to locusts, the palmer worm, the caterpillars, and caterpillars, to destruction 
comes on us like a flood. You know, we had the flood of Kentucky. Destruction comes on quickly, like a flood. Flood. If you don't ready, you can't get ready. I be ready. And army locusts come. They come like a fire. It's like evil spirits raging around, like fire. They canvas all around you. So when the sand bounds you, no matter how many times the sinner tries to resist, army keeps coming, keep coming, keep coming. It's like the power room. When he left the locust a locust left canker room a keep coming, one thing goes, another thing comes. Like it's like a, a, a battle of a highly trained army. One stage, next stage, the next stage, keep coming, keep coming. Just like if you was took over by drugs. You thought you had got over the drug, but something kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. You did cocaine a while back, you know, did heroin. It's like a locust coming, a canker worm. It kept coming and coming and coming. You thought you could get rid of it yourself. You can't do this by yourself. I tell you, sisters and brothers, you can't do this by yourself. You need God. Satan has his teeth clamped on you. He says, whose teeth are teeth of a lion? He calls waste, ruin, and mourning. So the field is wasted. The land mourning for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. Everything in your life withered away. The vine is dried up. The fig tree languishes. Even all the trees of the field are withered. Joy is withered away. This ain't even my third point. Restore what the canker worm stole. If he has something stolen from you, restore what the canker worm stole. So he has something stolen from you. How did it make you feel? If he had a family heirloom, how did it make you feel? If he had a anointing stolen, if he had your joy stolen, if he had the peace stolen, you know sometimes you'd be feeling good about something, you get a phone call from somebody across the state to talk to you, it steals your joy, it makes you feel sad. If you had some money stolen, I can't even tell you, whatever the enemy stole from you, let it go. Let it go. God will give it back to you. Whatever the enemy is taking, God will give it back with physically, mentally, financially, mentally, spiritually. God will restore what the enemy take from you. God will restore what the canker worm took from you. God will restore what the locust took from you. God will restore what was taken from you by grasshoppers and all the insects. So what does restoration mean? It means like bring back. You have it. You see the prior certain stage, you know, it brings you back to the stage you was at. It means to return someone or something. It means to return to a former condition. It means like to Repair or renovate. You know, if you renovate this house, the house was, when you first got it, it was raggedy, walls down, you painted the house, did the grass, foundation, it's like a rebuilding of things. It's just bring it back to the original condition. I'm talking about some areas that Satan uses to steal from us. Like the sin of canker worm, sin about forgiveness, but there are many different, different sins. It comes in many different ways. Let's talk about these two different ones. So I mentioned, mentioned canker worm. Uh, also, I didn't talk about the canker worm of finances. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Malachi, the third chapter, verse 10. I call it the, it's Malachi, the third chapter, verse 10. It's not biblical, but I call it the finance focus. Excuse me, it's Malachi 3.11. It says, Malachi 3.11 says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. So have you ever really seen a canker worm or a caterpillar? I was just looking through some weeds, this, you know, my grass this week, doing some weeds and stuff, you know. I saw these weeds that had holes and the leaves. So I got to surround it down to kill it. Then the holes was there. I didn't see the calipers, I didn't see the canker worms, I didn't see the crickets, whatever, I didn't see nothing, but I saw the holes and the leaves, so I know something had been there. I know something was eating them. So you don't actually see the canker worm the finances, but you know you have holes in your pocket because you know you have this money, but it goes somewhere. Where's it going to? You don't know where it's going, but it's going somewhere. So the canker worm has sometimes it's like green, light green color, it could be like dark color, they have two or three pairs of legs, caterpillar has five legs, but it could be like bright green or 
medium green, almost black. It has, I mean, it has pale strips in the summer and other strips in the fall. It can be very smooth or it can be very hairy. hairy. In other words, the kangaroo, the locusts, they have different forms, different shapes, different varieties. I'm like the devil. The devil comes at you, it comes at you different ways. It comes at you, not if you don't like something, it comes at you what you like. So I have good news to you though. Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 30 through 31. That's Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 30. Two thirty-one. It says, "Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But he, if he is found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all substance to his house." So restoration is coming. Restoration is coming. The Satan has left holes in the church. Satan has left holes in your family. He left holes in your finances. He left holes in your health. He stole your job. He stole your life. He stole your mind. They have left holes in your relationships, whether it be spiritual relationships or physical relationships. I have good news. God can restore what Satan stole. He will restore everything he took. You might be like Job and get double for your trouble. I tell you, you got these Restoration is something big. When God blesses you, He might bless you with something too big to receive. Remember when the disciples were out fishing, Peter was out fishing with the disciples. He went out fishing all night long. He was a professional fisherman. Remember, he came back after fishing all night. He didn't catch anything. Jesus was on the shore. They didn't know he was there. He said, Children, have you caught any food? Have you any food? He said, No. Jesus said, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. So they went out, cast the net on the right side, they found so much fish, so much they had to share with their friends, a blessing. It's just like when you receive your stress pressure back, you get so much back, a bee, like a blessing. You know, destruction, so Satan is real. But he does destruction sometimes in different phases. Like I mentioned earlier about the, the butterfly, you got uh, first comes, you got the canker worm, an inch worm or the law egg in the mouth. You got the caterpillar, which is the law of the butterfly. You got the pomer worm, which is the law of the beetle. The canker worm, it goes back to the bark of the tree, eats it, and destroys it. It's like the lifeline, a covering of a tree. But also, like in a church, it's like the covering of a church, too. If you remove the covering from the church, remove the fellowship from the church, it can't proceed. This thing when COVID came along, COVID thought it had a church, you know, the church is when nobody was going to church and everything, but after a while they started doing church online and TV and everything, you know, so it still kept on going. And a canker worm was like, after we got a minor congregation, tried to remove the Holy Spirit from the church. It didn't work. And they said you got a caterpillar, caterpillar trying to suck the lives out of the church. You got different denominations in the church that tried to suck the life out of the worship. Palmer worm. What the palmer worm does is like it eats the fruit and the fruit trees and leaves. It's like it might eat up the fellowship, eat up the joy from going to church. Then you have the locust. The locust is like the palmer worm, it dies out. Then it becomes a locust. The locust takes the leaves, takes everything he left. So there's stages of destruction, like a well formed army. So the locust eats the spiritual stuff, like it eats the fellowship. Out of doctrine. So when I say fellowship, and even the leaves, like you got a, a tree in the summertime, you know how hot it is in the summertime? You got leaves. The leaves provide like a, a covering. You know, if it's raining outside, you're going underneath a tree, or it's hot outside, you're going underneath a tree. So the leaves, like in the church, provide a covering. So if I try to eat the leaves, it's the east of leaves, and you know, it takes your covering away from you. So these are when you come under, under fellowship of the Holy Ghost. In conclusion, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes to give life and give it more abundant. They said that locusts are destructive pests. They devour everything in sight. Has anyone lost anything? Have you lost a, a job, house, a family member, health, relationships, money? Have you lost time? 
Maybe you experienced the sin of a canker worm. Maybe you experienced the sin of losing money. Maybe you experienced some kind of other canker worm attack. I don't care what you lost, but you lost something 30 years ago or 30 days ago. God will restore by the canker worm at Eden. So to get what the locusts took, how do you get that? I'm talking about the locusts and the canker worm and the palm worm, he's all dedicated. I'm talking about getting restoration. But how do you get this restoration? John 1 9 says, We confess our sins. We have to repent or turn from evil ways. Confess with our mouth, leave in our heart. Confess and accept Jesus as your Savior. Have a relationship with Jesus. Once you have a relationship with Jesus, you will be restored by the canker worm stole. So if you return to God, He will return to you. So return to God, return to you. Can you stand with me for the benediction? May the grace of God, the Lord of the Speech of the Holy Spirit, rest through and abide for her and after and forever. As you leave here,